schmoozing is over in the aisle there. She's in the middle of a, her third pitch. Well, I hope it's uh, been what feels like a pretty productive day. So, yes, has it been? Great. By the way, you know all that nonsense I said at the beginning about the staff and what they did? Actually, I'm totally responsible for all of the good things that happened today. No, well, that's great. That's great news. and. Uh, um, more to come, but most most uh, exciting is to have uh, uh, Mark with us uh, today and Kevin Rom. Kevin, by the way, plays Lee McDermott on Desperate Housewives, and uh, and by the way, uh, Kevin uh, just got, is it okay to announce your marriage? He's just proud of it. he's very he should be proud of it. Just uh, was married what three weeks ago? Five five weeks ago. Five weeks ago to. A baby heart surgeon. Whoa, that's really. Pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> a woman, though, surprisingly enough. So, yeah. <laughs> At any rate, um, we're really, really flattered. We're we're flattered that uh, you're spending time with us, and uh, we just spent a little time in the. In, I, guess, I guess it's called the green room upstairs, and I I told them that uh, all of you were aspirational had uh, ideas, uh, you know, you're sort of wondering about the mysteries of this town and the business and trying to uh, navigate your way through it. And uh, so with that, I can't think of anybody better than uh, uh, Mark and Kevin. And uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce them and it's all yours. Thank and you. apparently I, I have a video for, for Desperate just to remind folks what I do, so. <laughs> darkness, four of us. It's big. I remember it was freezing, it was two in the morning and I was cutting the grass in front of my house and that gown. I love dancing on the bar. Susan's locked out of the house. Naked. And she thanks him for being a gentleman and not looking at her. And I say, well, I gotta admit, I might have stuck a peep. Oh! And for what it's worth, wow. Good night. <laughs> Be bad. Be naughty. Hit on a stranger. Someone out there? I can assure you, I never do this sort of thing. What won't we be doing in season eight? <laughs> Oh, you know someone's gonna die. That's what happens on Wisteria Lane. It started with the bang. It's gotta end that way, too. The final season's gonna go out with several bangs. Hopefully leave some jaws on the ground. I'd love to see Lynette and her husband fall back in love. Hopefully Mary Alice can reveal some deeper secrets that we might not know about yet. I made out with two chicks once in college. Mark Cherry's told us in season one he knows exactly how it's gonna end. I can't imagine the girls splitting up. And break. Eva said we should all be in a car. Felicity is going to drive. I like to have my feet kind of hanging out the window. Terry's lounging in the back seat, and we all go over a cliff with some great music playing. Hi! I'll be the first one to say goodbye, 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 goodbye. Look how far you've come. <laughs> okay, so these people don't know that you did not start out as a writer. That you started out as a musical dance theater performer uh, at uh, Cal State Fullerton. Fullerton. Yes, I knew that. And so you you got an uh, MFA in musical dance theater. Performed. No, just just a BA. Just I, didn't, oh, I, oh. I wasn't in college that long. Just a BA. And then you performed with the Young Americans all over the world. Yep. And then what was the what was the thing that happened that you decided I'm not going to be a performer. I'm going to be a writer. That's a that's a funny story. I uh, so I, I was going to be an actor and, a, and pr primarily a musical theater performer. I took voice for ten years, so all that money down the drain. Um, and uh, I the after I graduated in um, December of uh, 
December of 85 is when I graduated, they have these things called the URTAs, which are the uh, university and regional theater auditions. So you go and audition for MFA programs and... Uh, and regional summer, theater. And summer stock stuff. And so I went to it, and I got a lot of offers, and I got one offer, uh, I don't know if you know Bill Esper at Rutgers um, invited me to go there. And it was kind of, it was the, the turning point, because I would have had to move to the East Coast. I'm, you know, I was born in Long Beach and raised in Orange County. And suddenly I was like, oh, this is the moment where I have to decide if I'm going to do this. And I suddenly just got, you know, this whole wave of, oh, this is a bad idea. And, um, you know, and I thought, let me, I want to stay in Southern California. And my best friend, uh, Jamie Wooten, uh, we would go to parties together. I met him when I was performing in The Young Americans, and we would go to parties together and make people laugh. And Jamie and I thought we were pretty darn funny, so we thought, well, let's, we, we watched, one night we watched a particularly bad episode of ALF, and we said, we can write something better in the amount of time it took to show that. And so it was kind of a dare we had with each other. So um, he was, at that time, doing cruise ships singing for senior citizens. I was doing children's theater down in La Jolla performing for young children, which, you know, um, is a horrible mismatch. And uh, we said to, I know, can you imagine me? Hello, hello little girl, I'm going to sing a song, shut up. Um, and I was like, and so we just said, let's, let's move up to LA to do this. So we didn't really know anyone in the business. We, we had one contact, which was our friend Diane Kerwick, her brother was a writer on Family Ties. So that was our one showbiz contact. So we moved up here February 1st, 1988, and uh, we got an apartment with our friend Bruce, and the three of us got an apartment together. And Jamie and I, that first month, we wrote a spec script for the Golden Girls. We ended up writing a bunch of spec scripts, but we wrote this really, um, what we thought was a really good episode of the Golden Girls. And then the strike of 88 started, four weeks after we came to town, which was a little frustrating. And so for six months, the town was not working. No one was hearing pitches. No one was talking. And then when the town went back to work um, at the, after the summer, at the beginning of the fall of 88, um, no one was reading the scripts because everyone had to staff immediately. And we didn't, you know, we had managed to get an agent during the strike because the agents had nothing to do. So they had time to meet with us. But, uh, and then we, the next year, February of 89, we got a thing called the Warner Brothers Writers Workshop. And, um, and they, they got our script and people started hearing about us. And in June of 89, I had my first job. We were on a little show called Homeroom, which was about uh, inner city school children. So again, I'm perfect to write for that. And, uh, and while we were there, the people at Golden Girls heard about us and we did, wrote a, um, a spec. While I would work in the day writing Homeroom, we go at night, wrote our freelance spec for uh, or the freelance episode for Golden Girls, and then it was really great timing. Homeroom got canceled in December, and then Golden Girls hired us in January, and I started on Golden Girls January of 1990. So it was less than two years from coming to, to LA, which you know at the time it felt like forever, and now in retrospect I realize that's a pretty quick trajectory. And the thing that was cool was that <clears throat> Aside, you know, we came to the town not knowing anyone but Stephen Kerwick, and Stephen was the one who gave um, our script to his agent, and so, you know, that one contact made a difference, and then we were here and we just started meeting people, and we studied scripts. Um, I had no knowledge of writing, but I got sitcom scripts from other shows. We would had, God, our home was filled with them, um, and we would just study structure. So, you know, when it, it's funny, when it comes to writing, Cal State Fullerton always has me back to honor me um, as an example of a successful alumnus. And um, it's always funny to me because they didn't train me in the thing that made me successful, but they take complete credit for it. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, it, but I did learn, I did read many plays while I was at Cal State Fullerton, and so, you know, through reading plays and then just studying television scripts, which is a, a different art form, very much so. And... We started, you know, just reading the stuff, and we taught ourselves because we were smart. And you know, Lord knows there was a trial and error, and I would hate to pass out anything I wrote in 1988 or 89 here because you could blackmail me forever. But uh, but 
but we, the, the learning process began, and we were very lucky to be on TV shows where we were working with other writers and we learned from them, and certainly getting onto Golden Girls, that's like going, you know, going and getting your doctorate in comedy. Uh, we were there with so many funny people. Mitch Hurwitz started like three weeks after us, um, and Mitch, for those of you who know... A little show called Arrested Development? Yeah, that was, that's Mitch's show, so we were all baby writers together. And, uh, and then Tracy Gamble, who created Eight Simple Rules, he was, he was on the, the show and stuff. So we, it was a really good staff, really fun, um, but very intensely comedic. And then Jamie and I, uh, you know, we were on that show for see, seasons five, six, and seven. We did the ill-fated spin-off Golden Palace, um, which is just dreadful. And then we, Jamie and I, got an overall deal at 20th Century Fox um, to create our own shows. So I started out with Jamie, and we created a show called The Five Mrs. Buchanan's, which lasted less than one season. Then we created a show called The Crew, which was really dreadful, and um, that lasted a season. And uh, then Jamie, our partnership broke up. We really had different. Um, goals that we wanted um, artistically and personally so we kind of split up I stayed in um, you know just trying to create shows and I went a couple of years of complete unemployment then I created a show uh, with uh, Tony Vitale based on a movie called Kiss Me Guido uh, and they aired five episodes and that was called Some of My Best Friends and that was in the year that aired in February of 2001 so I did the show, and I was kind of proud of that one. It was it didn't get an audience, but I actually thought we did a good job on that one. And I was then completely unemployed and did not get an interview for another job for two and a half years. And um, and no one wanted to meet with me, and so I kind of had a little talk with myself. Um, I don't even know. So if, did you move back yet at this point, or are you still in LA? No, I was still. I was. Still, I was always in LA, although I was spending a lot of time at my mom's. Like, so what are you doing? Um, you know. Do you I, have any cheese? I know, really. My mother would give me cheese. It was lovely. Um, no, it's funny because that's. It's actually part of the story, which is I. Um, I was so unemployed and so broken. When you're like 40 and you're broke, it's like so embarrassing, especially if you like been writing on Golden Girls, you're kind of thinking, oh cr crap, am I that guy who had that one brief moment and then it's just all over? You know, I kind of had a talk with myself going, well, okay, are we a hack? And I thought to myself, you know, I don't think I've actually pushed myself as hard as I could. I tended to write for people, network executives, studio executives, this is what you want. The very first, uh, our second spec script Jamie and I did was for my, our agent who said, I, I would love you to have a night, uh, a new heart or a night court. And so I was always like writing for other people. And I thought, let me write to impress myself. So I was like, okay, let me start with an idea. Let me talk about something that hasn't been talked about before, which is an easy question to pose oneself. Then when you have to sit down in front of your computer, it's like, all right, what is that thing? And as luck would have it, I was visiting my mom and we were watching coverage of the Andrea Yates trial. For those of you who don't remember, the woman who drowned all her children in a bathtub in Texas. And we were watching coverage of this trial and I remember turning to my mother and saying, my gosh, can you imagine a woman being so desperate that she would hurt her own children? And my mom took her cigarette out of her mouth and said, I've been there. <laughs> and I was, needless to say, astounded. And I said, well, what do you mean? And for the very first time in my life, my mother, who I always thought of as the perfect wife and mother, she started telling me stories about how alone and desperate she had felt when my father would, was, uh, he would leave our family home. We were living at my grandparents' farm. My grandparents were in town. We, my mother was alone on a farm in the country in Oklahoma with three young children, ages five, four, and three. My dad would go Monday through Friday to get his master's degree at the University of Oklahoma. And so she was all alone with no neighbors, no help. And I didn't realize, and she had never mentioned, that she was going a little crazy. <laughs> And so she started telling me all these stories. And as my mother, who I had just idolized and put it on a pedestal in terms of her, you know, her gifts as a wife and mother, as soon as she started telling me these stories of frustration and loneliness and desperation, I thought, well, good heavens, if, if you felt this way, then every woman has felt this way. And I thought, oh, that's something I can write about. And um, so I decided to write it, and I came up with the title first, Desperate Housewives, which I thought was a pretty spiffy little title. And uh, 
and then I began to write. So that's, and that's, you know, and that's, I, I tell that story mostly to new writers, which is, so many people can tell you what's good or what's bad, or they'll give you their opinions, everyone has them. At some point, I think that the harshest judge must be yourself, and you must work really hard to please yourself. And if you're lucky, like me, where I was really like, I was really trying to build my house correctly, I had something to say. Then I figured out a really good structure. I actually designed the characters. Um, the next thing I did after the title is I said, okay, I have to have four women. They're desperate. Why are they desperate? So I gave them four different kinds of desperation. You know, I thought I wanted a pretty, I, I thought I would only get one pretty housewife. I don't know why I thought that. So I made one of them a model, and she was desperate because she was in the suburbs and her husband wasn't paying attention to her and she was bored and she was having an affair. I made another one desperate because her kids were little and the husband was always away, obviously using my mom's life on this, and, the, and she doesn't know how to deal with her kids and the kids are driving her crazy. And she used to be a career woman. Um, another housewife is desperate because she's the perfect wife and mother, but she's driving her husband and kids crazy with her perfection. And the husband wants a divorce in the pilot, and that's why she's desperate. And then I had one housewife who was desperate because her husband had left her, and she had a 12-year-old da daughter, and she's, you know, in her late 30s, and, and like a lot of those women, she, like, she wants back in on the fairy tale, and she's desperate to get one more chance back in. So I just designed them with desperation in mind of why they were desperate, and what was really great about that is I, without thinking of it, I gave them all something they wanted very much. And for those of you who you know have been writing a while, you know that if a character really wants something, much easier to write. The stories become much more vibrant if that character has something they're going after. It also becomes easier to then attract good actors to it as well, which I would say to think about. Now go back to from, uh, so from, you haven't had a meeting in two and a half years. You find the thing you're going to write that's going to change. You write it. What, what happens next? How do you get the meeting? Now that you have this great script and you have no meetings, how do you get the meeting? Well, this is the fun part of the story. So I've written the best script of my life. I finish it. I'm like, oh, this is great. I know this is really good. Um, I give it to my agent. And then my agent can't sell it. We first, before I wrote the idea, I, 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 when I had the idea after the talk with my mom, I first tried to do with, with what a lot of writers do, which is pitch it, because I was kind of, you know, going slowly but surely broke, because I, I was spending all this money because I wasn't working. And CBS turned it down, and NBC turned it down, the pitch. And, and the pitch. the pitch. Fox turned it down, HBO turned it down, Showtime turned it down, <laughs> Lifetime Television for Women turned it down, which... <laughs> When Lifetime turns it down, that's a sad, sad day. There was extra cheese that night. Yeah. Mom had to give me a lot of extra cheese that night. So, um, so everyone turned it down, and my attitude was, no, 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 I know this is a good idea. I don't care what you people say. Um, I don't know people is the word I used. I think it was something more violent. But I, I, was, I was like, no. So, you know, fuck this. I'm going to write it on spec. And I did. And then I finished my perfect script. And I s walked out. Here, here's, my, here's my script. Send it out to the industry and let them bow down before me. And, uh, and no one bought it. And I was, and that's that's a really rough moment when you've been turned down by you know places. Interestingly enough, and just a little side note, I hadn't given it to ABC. ABC was in such bad shape at that point. Even I wasn't wanting to work with ABC. <laughs> Lifetime, um, maybe not, <laughs> not ABC. ABC. Um, which became this was before Animal Planet. Yeah, so yeah, this is it, it became fortuitous uh, after the fact. But I look back, going, why wasn't I giving it to ABC? Anyway, I I. Um, so I, I hand this script to, to, you know, my agent gives it to all these networks and they all say no. And I'm now flummoxed because I go, well, I don't think I can do much better than this. And then under the heading of sometimes the worst day of your life is actually the best day of your life and you just don't know it. I found out my agent of 14 years had been embezzling from me. And my, a lawyer called me up, and another one of her clients had discovered it, and they, they, they called me. And, uh, and then I, I had my, my, people look, my lawyer and his people look into my finances, and we found out that, indeed, I had had $79,000 uh, stolen from me, which actually started to make sense of why I was going broke much more quickly than I thought I should be. Um, and uh, so I sent my agent to jail. And because, you know, once you find out your agent's going to jail, it's a good time to look for a new agent. <laughs> um, 
Um, and so I gave my, um, my friends gave, uh, two writer friends of mine gave the script to Paradigm. And Paradigm read this, and they weren't taking any clients um, at the time. They had a fairly full, um, you know, stable. And they read this, and they went, well, we got to represent this guy, because we think this is pretty good. And one of the first questions they asked me is, why haven't you been able to sell this? And I said, well, I've been giving it to all the, um, you know, the, the comedy departments, and my agent was giving it there. And Debbie Klein at Paradigm said, well, that's your problem. If you call it a comedy, it doesn't seem that funny. You've got to call it a soap opera that's got some comedy in it. And I went, uh, OK, I don't care. And uh, she said, let me hook you up with someone who is a soap opera writer and you know, see if there's some stuff we can do to help with that. And uh, Chuck Pratt, who was, uh, had done General, he, was, he had done Melrose Place, but he was back on General Hospital where he got his start. He read it and he said, I don't need to do anything this, to this. It's in great shape. He said he gave me one great word of advice. I just had, for those of you who remember the pilot, I had a note at the very end that indicated Mary Alice had killed herself for a mysterious reason. I had no other mystery elements in the script. Chuck was the one who said, Make sure, you've, if mystery is a part of this, you've got to make sure that they see that there's mystery beforehand. So there's a, a scene where uh, Zach, the young boy, finds his uh, father digging up the family pool. And there's another thing where the father, uh, Paul Young, hears the women talking and he has a mysterious look. Literally like maybe 25 seconds of, of page space in the script. But it changed it completely because then it added that extra layer. So it was now comedy and drama and mystery. and. Um, we sent that script to ABC, and ABC bought it, and on September 15th, 2003, I found out ABC was buying my script for $100,000, and on that Friday, I got a full restitution check from my agent as part of her plea bargain. So that week was a really good week for me. Um, and, then, uh, and then the journey began. All right. Okay, I miss okay. Okay, so I, my, one of the questions I have for you is what is the difference between what you thought your job was as a showrunner versus what your job is as a showrunner? Oh, God, that's a big, big leap. Yeah. Um, the most important thing to, to know as a creator is to have a firm handle on what you think you've created and le at least be able to say to people, this is what I'm trying to do. Now, as you move forward through production and getting it off the ground, things will present themselves to you where you'll find out, oh, OK. It's like, I actually thought I'd written something that was just oh, ultra chic and so sophisticated. And I remember, um, I thought I'd really written my version of American Beauty. And I remember when the TV Guide fall preview issue came out, TV Guide, I turned to the thing that had Desperate Housewives on it, and TV Guide said, oh, it's this year's must-see guilty pleasure. Really? You have to feel guilty about seeing my show? <laughs> and what I learned was people didn't perceive it as, as kind of this removed, cold intellectual exercise. They really bought the juice and fun of it. And I realized, having also met Alan Ball, um, it's so funny. They kind of reflect our personalities. I'm just more, it's just more out there. That's who I am, you know, as an artist. And that came through. So that was one of the things that kind of changed me. One of the things I also had to learn going forward, I learned, you know, I've made so many mistakes over the eight years in terms of storylines I shouldn't have done or approaches to material. It's been this amazing kind of, it's the world's best writing class is what it is. And one of the things I learned is that when you create something, a TV show, like a movie or a book or a play is different because it's, you know, it's, you finish it and it's there and it's done. A TV show, you have to create it and also knowing that how can it keep running for year after year after year. You have to build in mechanisms that allow it to run. And I did part of my work pretty well and then there were some things I learned along the way that I, I hadn't done really well. So the, the biggest thing I think I learned was it's not enough to just come up with a cool idea for your pilot. You better have an idea of, okay, how can this continue to go forward over the years? Because what TV, a lot of times young writers will go in and they'll pitch an idea that's great. Well, I actually, I'll tell you a couple of ideas that I thought had been on TV and I thought they should have been features. I always thought Pushing Daisies was one of those brilliant pilots I had ever seen. Um, and it should have been a movie. It, I don't think it was meant to be a TV show because I spent every episode going, oh, don't get close to her or if you touch her, she'll die. And it's like that tension you can sustain for two and a half hours, I don't think so over a course of years. Um, flash forward, I thought that, I think that would have made more sense as a miniseries or a, a, a movie. 
It's, it's the idea that the, the networks or the studios can say, you know, and you better have, if they have doubts that it can run seven years and you think, no, 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 I got it, I got it covered, just make sure you have your explanation for it. Because there's some, you know, some stories need two hours to tell and some stories need years to tell. And it's up to the creator to figure that out. So that's, I think that's the biggest part of my job that I sort of knew going into it, but I learned a lot along the way of how you keep it, how you can keep it going. Television can be very tricky that way. That's one of the reasons I like cable, because you do smaller seasons so they don't kind of use up all your juice. So uh, uh, do you have anything else you wanted to add before we open up to questions? Uh, the only thing I would say is, uh, you know, I always look at my own life story and I go, I was, you know, a guy, you know, singing, singing, you know, in Hello Dolly down at Curtain Call Dinner Theater. And, um, yeah, I was the head waiter. Pouring Rudy. the water? Yeah. Pouring the water no. while you're singing? I could do a one-handed cartwheel during the waiter's gallop. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm so proud. Uh, so and good. then I decided to become a writer, and I just, you know, opened some scripts and taught myself. And because I'm, I like to think of myself as smart, and, and I have some good taste and an ability to learn, um, I did so. And I came to this town, and I didn't, you know, I wasn't the son of anyone famous, and I, I, you know, didn't really know that many people except for the sister of a guy who was on Family Ties, and I found my way in. So it's a long-winded way of saying I think this town is really the doors are you, the doors will open for anyone who is smart and talented and willing to work hard. You always need an element of luck along the way, um, and certainly luck for me came in the form of of having a friend who was on, um, you know a friend who knew, whose brother was on Family Ties, he gave me some good advice. And also when we got into the Warner Brothers workshop, the people connected to that knew people who then ended up um, helping my career. So yes, luck is a part of it, but I, uh, the town, it's so funny, I was so daunted by coming to Hollywood um, in 1988, and now that I'm here, I really understand, no, you know, um, it, this is a place where you just have to, the doors will not open up for you, you have to force them open. But just be really smart and, and work hard and make sure like when you finally get someone important to read that script of yours, uh, make sure it's in good shape. I know so many people who just like want to hand their first draft in and it's like, uh, uh, don't do that. Don't do that. I wrote 17 drafts of Desperate Housewives. 17. I kept going away from it and coming back to it and going, oh, I think I can do this better. I think I can do this better. 17. So sometimes working really, 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 really harder than the people next to you is really helpful. And because then when someone finally reads your stuff, it's ready to go. So uh, just don't be daunted by the town. Um, just have belief in yourself, but also be smart. Be honest with yourself, because a lot of people lie to themselves too. And uh, that my life changed the day I was honest with myself and go, okay, am I really doing the best kind of work I, I'm capable of? And since the answer was no, you know, that's when my life changed. So there you go. And just from real quickly before we open to questions, from an actor's point of view, uh, reading the material, it's good material is easy for an actor to do well, and and good actors are drawn to really good material. And so when 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 you have characters that have really strong intentions and really strong needs and desires, actors are drawn to it, and you'll find them, and you you then look better. And by the way, that's and that's why sometimes the fact that I took acting classes helped because. Um, Although I certainly never possessed the level of sophistication or awareness of scripts that someone like Kevin did, because Kevin has been doing it so much longer than I, I did it for. But people like Kevin and Felicity Huffman, you know, I was able to talk to them and, and relate because I had done that. And um, so that's why any, any life experience you have in a weird way can help. Um, I, I love the fact that I started out performing because that really, you know, has put me in good stead going forward. I understood some stuff about plays. Um, I, I understood about performing. And in a weird way, even as being an executive producer, the fact that I was a performer, there's so many executive producers like they uh, don't give good interviews because they don't know how to talk. They're used to be alone, alone in a dark room typing. And um, when Desperate came out, I got so many interviews on TV and stuff because, well, I'm me. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, it was all that, all that time spent on stage really kind of had a, a, an extra benefit. So, so anything, anything that you've done in your life can, um, can, can help your journey, but, uh, and then whatever else you need, you, you, you've got to go out and get quickly. All right, so let's hope. So questions, anybody have a question? Right here? Oh, oh, there, oh there's a mic. Fancy. Oh my gosh. How you doing? Um, 
My question is, you said that you read a lot of scripts when you started writing. You didn't know how to write. You wrote a lot of, you read a lot of scripts. Did you read scripts that you didn't like, or did you read like scripts that storylines that you liked? How did you formulate which are good scripts and bad scripts for you to teach you that? Well, that um, it's interesting. I, I, I mean, I didn't know whether I, I just got a bunch of scripts, so I didn't know if I would like them or not like them when I got them, um, and I was getting mostly TV. So, and sometimes I think I might have gotten a couple, like I think there was a Cheers episode or two where I may have seen that, seen it already, but I wanted to see what it looked like on the page. Because seeing it on the page, you don't, when you watch TV, one of the things that um, I always try to tell young writers is, um, it's there, you need the, the need for economy. If you actually see your average TV script, it's line, line, sentence, 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 line, maybe three lines in a row, line. We write, we say things, we get a maximum amount of information and plot done in very little, with as few words as possible. It's its own haiku, if you will. Um, whereas if you go to read plays, you know, no one thinks twice in a play about having a long monologue. Um, you've been doing plays recently, you know, because on stage it's just actors. So the actors, it's, it's the stage is all about the actors. They always say, see, stage is an actor's medium, uh, film is a director's medium, and television is the writer's medium because because of where the control is. And I think that that's absolutely true. And I think for when you really start on TV, just know that you don't, you don't in, if you're doing a half hour, I think you've got like what 22 minutes to tell your story, and um, it's about 42 40. One minutes in in an hour long, you know, episode of television for a drama. So that's 41 minutes to tell your story. Now, if you're doing Desperate Housewives and you have a, need a plot line for four different women and a, a, your and a storyline for your mystery, that's five storylines. So divided by 40 is like you about you got about eight and a half minutes to tell each story. You know, so you know you can do a lot with eight and a half pages. You know, or in in eight and a half minutes, I should say, but you know, economy is so very important. So, and now to go to your other point about judging it, when one of the things I did when I kind of took myself to writing school, I said, let me go study people whose work I respond to. The truth of the matter is, is that you, you sh as an artist, you won't and shouldn't respond to every kind of author. Um, I like Neil Simon's best plays. I like a lot of Dorothy Parker. I read a lot of Dorothy. I, I, by the way, that's another thing I do. I read a lot of like short stories or poetry or novels, sometimes to just infuse myself with what different creators do. Because if you just kind of are exist in your own world, I don't think it feeds your soul creatively. That's just a little thing for me. But like I was reading William Inge. I was reading Arthur Miller, um, Tennessee Williams. I can't get enough of Tennessee. Uh, so what I would do is I would just read how other people had done it, and then when it came to TV, I would read mostly, try to get scripts of shows I'd seen so I understood. But sometimes I would get scripts for new shows. Now, um, I remember reading a play by Tennessee Williams, the the, the play version of Summer and... Uh, no, what's that? Uh, Geraldine Sweet, Page. Sweet Bird of Youth. Sweet Bird of Youth, thank you. And, um, oh, I hated it. I thought, oh, this is a sucky play. The movie's much better. They changed it completely. One of the, I think, the things that it's up to you as an artist is don't, just because it got published, don't assume it's good. There's so many shitty writers making money in this town. <laughs> um, it is perfectly acceptable for you to, to read something and go, well, I don't care that that's success. I don't care that it grossed $100 million. I think it sucks. Because that's what, that's what all the writers who are working do to each other. Um, you know, be just go, this is stuff I respond to. That, I don't get that stuff. This is what I get to. That's when you start to develop as a writer, is you're responding to the, the things that, that make your heart go like this. I mean, it's, you know, it's perfectly, I, I, it's perfectly okay. I, I have a friend who, um, he always, he's a dear friend, but we always disagree on stuff we like. And, um, and I finally learned to not be ashamed of saying, oh, I didn't get that, didn't like it. And then there's stuff like Hannah and her sisters. First time I saw it, I didn't quite get it. And then in subsequent viewings, I'm like, okay, now I get it. It's one of my favorite movies now. But for whatever mood I was in when I saw it, it just it didn't get through. So it's just all about as you go out as an artist, you know, pay attention to the stuff you like that makes sense to you. And then, you know, don't be ashamed if you go, that's not my cup of tea. I like, I know everyone just, you know, Harold Pinter just like won the Nobel Prize about three years ago. I fucking don't understand Harold Pinter. I sit in the theater and I go, I don't understand what's going on. 
so a lot of people, I think there are a lot of critics who, if they don't understand it, they think it must be brilliant. I just go, I don't understand it. So that's the thing is, learn to just be open and honest with yourself as an artist and go, this is my cup of tea, that not so much. And I don't, I don't care that other people are raving about it. And then, at some point, you might go back to and go, oh, wait. Now I see it differently. That's the other thing. As you get older, you start going back to stuff and you go, oh, now I get it. Now I get it. I'm old. Now I get this movie about middle-aged strife. So You need to see Betrayal. Pinter's Betrayal. You need to read right, that I'll one. I'll see Betrayal yeah, for you. Watch that one. Hi, Mark. Thanks for being here with us today and in sure. inspiring us to be true to ourselves and to be persistent. I got a two-part question. Uh, one, are you a baritone or a tenor? Lyric, lyric baritone. Thank you for asking. <laughs> And do you see yourself writing more original music into your future projects or a future project? Um, you know, music is tough because if you're doing a television show with music, and I, I think the people who do Glee and Smash have discovered this, if you do a production number, that's, what, two minutes? Well, that's a whole scene. That's a whole, maybe, and maybe the musical number is even longer, but that's a whole plot development. So the more you put music into it, the less story you're going to have. So you, so it becomes tricky because you then have to do your episodes where you have less story to make room for the musical numbers. And as I've watched um, those those shows, I realize that you know it's really tricky. I'm I'm um, I'm very interested in writing the book for a Broadway musical where it's all self-contained. I love love it. I understand that form. Music and TV is just really tricky because, you know, we did it on Golden Girls. We did an episode where, um, I, and it was one that Jamie and I wrote, where Blanche goes to the rusty anchor and then she brings Dorothy along with her and then Dorothy starts singing at the bar and she starts getting all the attention from the men. And it was shocking because after we finished writing it, because we had two different musical numbers, B. Arthur sang a ballad in the show and uh, she sang What'll I Do from Irving Berlin and then... Um, we did a whole number with Rue where she was on the piano singing I Want to Be Loved by You in this great red dress. And uh, and everything goes horribly wrong as she's singing on the piano. And we had to do, I think like when you looked at the page count of that week's episode, it was like, you know, something like eight or nine pages less than the previous week's script, which was another reminder of, yeah, music, you know, just spreads. So my own thing is, I'm always so, you know, busy as an artist trying to, uh, artist, listen to me, I work in TV, say writer, you don't want to be seem pretentious. Um, uh, I always, like, want as much time to do the character and the dialogue stuff, so I probably would love to work with music at some point, but I'll probably wait to do it in features or, or theater. You know, I don't, I don't know that I'll be doing, developing TV with music. Mark, as the creator of the new Lifetime show, Devious Minds, what's going Maids. on? Maids. Maids. Maids, sorry. Mine, That's sorry. a whole different show. Um, what's going on with the actress Marina Clavino? Is she going to be allowed to go on to NBC's The Munsters? Um, right now, uh, we're in, we're still in negotiations with Lifetime, so I think that, that that question won't be resolved until we know what's happening with the Lifetime deal, so I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of actually, Lifetime and Disney are no, now negotiating, so I'm actually kind of on the outside waiting for my own little phone call about that, to be honest. Next question. Mark, um, how do you feel about your show ending? I mean, how do you go from eight years, of, or actually, you go through that struggling period, and then you have a successful show, and then now it's at an end. And I mean, how do you deal with that emotionally? It's like your baby. Um, yeah, it is. Um, I sort of killed my baby. Because I was the one who said, you know, let's let's end it after eight years. I was the one who went to the the network and said, you know, it was getting harder each and each season to come up with storylines for the the women where we hadn't done it before, you know, um, and uh, you know, and in just eight years, kind of felt right to me. That's kind of high school and college combined. Um, and so I was the one with, you know, with Bob Daly, who was my other executive producer, and Sabrina, my producing partner. We had long talks about it, and I, I had gone to Paul Lee when he first got the job and started talking about, I think this is when I want to end it. And there was some, that, you know, there was some discussion that I think the network at first was like, well, we would like it to go nine years, and I was like, eh, I think eight years is better. And with, there was some back and forth, and finally, you know, God love them, I, and I really appreciated this. They, they said, okay, we'll let you, we'll let you do it your way. Um, and so it was something that I wanted. And then the show, you know, we got a lot of lovely press and, and we built up to the ending and we had our ending. And um, I came home after the upfronts and I was like, oh, okay, my show's over. And I was like, oh, fuck, what do I do now? 
So it was kind of interesting because it's that thing of you can want something desperately. You can want, you know, this is really what I want. This is really what I want. And then, you know, I kind of went through about a week where I was like a little freaked out about it. Um, because, you know, it's such a family. I mean, it's a cliche, but it's true. It's such a family. I would go to work every day and laugh with people who I adored. And, um, you know, it was the hardest job I've ever had. But, um, you know, there was a lot that came with it. And also, you know, I, would, I always had to be somewhere. And then when you wake up that one morning, like, don't I have to? Oh, fuck, no. Okay, I'll just sit here and watch an MSNBC. You know, and then for four hours later, I'm like, okay, now I have to write something. And what's really cool is after you, all those years of doing it, it's really cool now for me because I've got, you know, we're in talks with Lifetime to do the show. I've gotten an offer to, to write a thing in New York. Um, my agent, I've, I now have feature agents, which is cool. Um, so, you know, that's, and that's the job of the writer. Um, I just had uh, dinner with John Logan, who uh, wrote Hugo and Last Samurai, and he won a Tony for the play Red. And, you know, he's like, oh, yes, I'm up every day at 7, and I'm to my computer by 8, and I write until lunch, and then I take an hour and off, and then I start writing again. I'm like, oh, fuck, you do, you're self-motivated. This is so depressing. <laughs> so um, so I have to, I'm going to go buy some of that and learn how to do that. So, all right, any other questions? Hi, Mark. Um, you talked about pitching to other networks, and then you said ABC, but you didn't finish that story. How did that ABC? Oh well, well, what happened is we didn't we didn't pitch to ABC. We just got the script after everyone had turned down the script, and then I got advice on how to um, do a little rewrite on it, um, which Chuck Pratt was helpful with. Then we gave it to ABC, so so they just read it, and it was the first spec script in eight years that Tom Sherman, the head of drama development, had bought. Um, so I actually never pitched at ABC. Um, they just bought the script. So, um, and you know, and I was very, very thankful for that. And and you know, and as it turned out, the we premiered the same year with Lost and Grey's Anatomy and uh, Dancing with the Stars. The, all those shows premiered within a 12-month period. And so suddenly, ABC was the hip place to be. But uh, you know, at that time, it wasn't. So I was just taking a gander. In terms of pitching, yeah, actually, do you have any questions about pitching? Because I'm really good at that. You know, the thing about pit I'll tell you one thing about pitching, and you can kind of probably perceive it a little just a bit from my persona. When I, my attitude about pitching is, I'm going to go do a show. I am walking in there to do my one-man show. Here's the story I want to tell you. And I start talking about the characters or whatever. And much in the way that I started, you know, and I told the Andrea Yates story to you guys. I, I remember the first critics tour, I, I told that story. And I think a lot of the critics were like appalled that I was suddenly talking about Andrea Yates. And then, you know, you get to the punchline, which was 100% true. That's what my mom said. Um, and everyone laughed. Suddenly, I think the, the people, the writers, the television writers there that day understood I had something to say and they paid attention to me. And that's the biggest thing is if when you walk in, if you take charge of the room, and that's not particularly difficult for me um, because I'm just a big old ham, but you learn, I'll learn to be a little hammy, you know, and you have to be true to yourself and do it in your own way, but take charge of the room and go, here's a story I have to tell and it's compelling. And just, you know, have it down. Because what you're really trying to say is, trust me to write something that will make you money. Trust me to write something that will be compelling and entertaining and something that will grab me. And if you can grab them in the room as you describe it, then they will start to feel like, wow, I was compelled by this. I wanted to know. Oh, that sounds fascinating. I get that. And hopefully, you're also giving them an idea that's new and fresh. And that's one of the reasons why this town, I think, is such a mecca for people, for, for new, newbies, is because inevitably, there's always some young kid who comes in who has an idea that's a little offbeat and doesn't make sense, and they come in and they change the, the way an entire industry works. Certainly, even though I was 42, I was 41 when I sold it, even though I was 41, the idea of doing a soap opera, a dramatic, and comedic soap opera about housewives in the suburbs was, the re there was a reason everyone was turning it down. No one was doing that show. And in retrospect, uh, some writer, and I, wasn't, I didn't think of this, but some writer said, oh, how smart it was of Mark Cherry to go back to the origins of soap operas, the 1950s housewives, and then turn it on its ear. That, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but the, the, the description is kind of apt in the sense of, there was a format there, I just gave it a whole new spin. 
And that's what this town thrives on, is people who are thinking out of the box. You guys haven't been, you know, what happens to writers is you pitch and you pitch and you pitch, and they always tell you, no, that's not what we're looking for. You know, we're looking for this, we're looking for this. The joke is they don't know what the fuck they're looking for. <laughs> They, 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 they think they do. They have testing groups and all this kind of stuff or whatever. But the truth is, you know, it's always some, something comes along. Well, it's like the, the movie The Blind Side. Executives all over town were shocked when that became a hit. You know, it was, it, you know a white woman taking, taking in a black football player, you know, and there's religious themes to it. it doesn't, it's not a surprise to the audience who went and saw it and related to it. Real big surprise to the executives who, who passed it over. Um, I just had lunch with a network president um, a week ago, a week ago today, and we were talking about, um, you know, CSI was passed on. Steve McPherson, who, who picked up Desperate Housewives, he was the head of Touchstone Studios, um, he loved that script, and Lloyd Braun, who was the head of ABC at the time, didn't like it. So Lloyd Braun cut it loose and it went to CBS and became this huge hit, and Steve McPherson was going, ah! And, you know, I, we were talking about this story and this network president said to me, we all have those stories. Every president in town has passed on something that went on to become a big hit. So the lesson from there is, and certainly my life and my career I think is an example of this, I just didn't take no for an answer because I knew that what I had was good. Now, that didn't mean I didn't keep working on it, like I said, 17 drafts. But it meant that I kept working on it because I knew there was something valuable there and I knew that I was going to prove them wrong. And to, to end, end this anecdote, Desperate Housewives premiered. We were number one in the ratings uh, the week we premiered. And four or five weeks later, Bob Wright, the head of GE, which owned NBC, called to find out who at NBC had passed on it. And if that's not a white writer's wet dream, <laughs> Nothing is. And I told him. Two more, okay, two more, two more, <laughs> two more questions. Mark, thanks for being here. Um, for the person that has a, a new sitcom pilot script, what advice can you give them for ne for breaking in without having? Because you had experience with Golden Girls, which I loved, but you had that experience prior to Desperate Housewives. Is there any advice you can give to that person of getting it in front of agents, whatnot? Because you know you know the drill, how hard it is. Yeah, the first thing I would would say is don't be too afraid of not having experience because new writers. Everyone's always on the lookout for the new writer. Every TV show in town has someone who's a story editor who's only been here for five seconds. Um, in a, in a weird way, being the writer who was successful and then whose career fell on hard times is actually, I think, in some ways, perhaps a harder sell to certain folks in the town. So don't be afraid of not having experience. You know, here the, the thing I would, would say is, if you give someone a piece of material that makes them laugh out loud, you know, that's, it's shockingly simple, I think then you go, well, how, how do I get it there? And I think that the way to always examine it is just keep looking at the characters' attitudes and the situations and asking yourself, is this fresh? A lot of, a lot of uh, times when you're writing, you know, it's, it's so typical when you start out to be, uh, to imitate what you see around you, because that's how you learn, you know. Then when you start to really go, okay, well, I've learned the form, now I have to start doing stuff that no one's ever seen before. To me, that's always the first thing I ask myself is, is this a character I've seen before? Is this something truly fresh? So that's what really will, I think, be the sexiest thing and make you attractive to, to, to agents or producers or whatever, is something that is so authentically out of your own experience, your own mind, but something that is very original and stuff they haven't seen before. That's the stuff that gets people excited. Someone uh, 20 years ago set the town afire, at least for five seconds, because it was a writer who decided his spec script, and this is in 1988, 89, he wrote a Dick Van Dyke spec script. And of course, Dick Van Dyke had been off the air for, you know, like 20 years. Um, but he got every, everyone in town was suddenly excited because, you know, at that point, everyone was handing in Cheers and Golden Girls and the Cosby Show spec script. And this guy did a Dick Van Dyke. And it was such a clever gimmick. But, you know, it, that's a, a good example of, eh, he thought outside the box. 
and he did something that not everyone was doing. So that's all I would say to you is just as you write your thing and you tell your story, just keep looking at the characters and go, is this as fresh as it can be? Is it as smart as I can be? Am I going somewhere where no one has ever gone? And is it emotionally compelling? Those are, you know, like, there's probably a whole list of those questions I could, you know, give you. Last one. Mark. Hi, Mark. Right here. Thank you. That was awesome. So I really uh, appreciate you sharing the highs and lows that I'm sure all of us new to Hollywood are going through and saying fuck like 50 times from the stage was awesome. Oh, so <laughs> did, I say, did I say fuck 50 times? Six, six, six times. Six on times. The, oh, okay, good. I'm, so, I'm sorry if I offended anyone. Um, I usually spend my time in writer's rooms and that's so okay in a writer's room. It was the best talk of the day. Thank you. So um, you mentioned that... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm blushing. Yeah, you mentioned that you thought that you were a has-been and maybe, you know, you were a hack and you were in that moment of reflecting on, you know, have I done my greatest work? So what's next for you? Do you feel like you've still got great work in you and what do you want to do? Um, I do. I, hopefully I've got a, I'm, as I always say, I'd like, um, I have Golden Girls and I have Desperate Housewives. I'd like one more really good thing for the obit. Um, uh, you know, just, you know, that one, one extra little thing. Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, what's really cool is I've got about approximately five minutes where people still want to work with me. I'm very aware of the transitory nature of this town, and I am under no illusions that, you know, I have a little residual heat from the show, and I'm going to spend the next year really trying to get a couple other things going and stuff, and then we'll see what happens from there. Um, you know, I do know that... Uh, that uh, I have stories inside me to tell, um, but I have also said to my agents, you know, at some point, you know, now that I've I've gotten the money I always wanted, if I just spend the rest of my life just writing stuff for myself, as long as I get it out on the page, that's what's satisfying is it's there, because you know it's it's look look what I created, and that's always the most satisfying aspect of it for me, and the second most satisfying aspect, um, just to give her her due, I just bought my mom a house. Always end with a mom story. Perfect. Well, first of all, what an unbelievably informative, but mostly entertaining. What a great package. Uh, and Kevin, thank you to my good Mark. friend, Kevin, who I said, they need someone to ask me questions. Come ask me questions, Kevin. And he did. Mark, Kevin, thank you both. The next session is around the pool and it involves ice and alcohol. <laughs> See you there. <laughs>